Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paola Gomez, and I am News Arts Program Director. I want to welcome you all to Happening Multicultural Festival, Community Voices. Today, we are starting with one very important panel and conversation. But before we go into this space of connecting with very, very uh, important voices in our communities, I would like to take a moment to offer this panel in this conversation in memory of our dear friend, Aaron Berhani. Aaron was scheduled to be here with us today. As a matter of fact, this panel started, and the idea of this panel started as a conversation with him and the importance of giving visibility to multicultural media. Aaron is no longer with us as he passed on May 1st as a consequence of COVID. In our entire community is still mourning uh, the passing and the loss of a good man. And as we remember him today in, in his work and his leg legacy inspire us, his sense of justice also inspired me right now at this moment. And I want to equally take the time to acknowledge the territory where we are. We are, and in my case, I am in Toronto. I am located in the indigenous traditional territory of the Huron-Wanda, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. I want to express my gratitude with Mother Earth for the resources that we're using. And I want to express an honor, gratitude in, in respect to Inuit, Metis, and First Nations that have been in this land since time immemorial. Let us think and reflect on how we all individually and collectively work towards reconciliation and how we work individually and collectively to take care of the land and the water, the same land and water that serve us and that is so crucial for our existence. Once again, welcome to Happening Multicultural Festival, the first and only festival created by community artists and entirely produced by newcomer, refugee, and immigrant artists. In this space, we recognize the talent and the brilliancy of us, those who have relocated into these um, territories, either by choice, looking for a better life, or because our lives were at risk where we were born. I want to express gratitude to uh, Canada Council for the Arts and to Factor Canada for financially supporting this festival so we can bring this type of, of events um, to life and we can give uh, the platform for, to appreciate and offer and celebrate the work of immigrant refugee and newcomer artists. I want to remind you that this event is being like streamed to our Facebook page, Muse Arts Facebook page, and that it will be recorded and later uploaded in our YouTube channel. I want to thank Kel and Sam for being here today, making sure that our conversations, our programming reach out as many community members as possible. We all are a work in progress, and we know that every day we do our very, very best to be better. So we 
invite you to be part of our process and be part of our journey. This conversation is very important. And with this, I would like to invite all our panelists to, to the screen and I will invite them to, uh, to, to uh, come on this space as we welcome them to start these very important conversations. And I'm going to share with you those who are uh, here witnessing, who are here uh, interested in this conversation of multicultural media, community and voices, that you can always ask your questions and leave these questions in the comment section of this uh, live stream. And I would like to welcome into the space Maran, a journalist um, that came to Canada as a, as a refugee and originally uh, from Sri Lanka. I will also like to invite into this space uh, our dear friend, uh, Cynthia, who is um, originally from Mexico and who also runs a um, multicultural space uh, rooted in, in Latin American work. Also our dear friend, Geza, uh, who has so much to share with us as he's extremely active in the community here in Toronto, but also with a very important journey that brings him here into this space. And of course, last but not least, our dear friend, uh, Diana, and I always uh, need to be corrected on this because Diana is how we said it in Spanish, but in English is Diana. So I will let her to correct me uh, and how I should be pron pronouncing her name uh, Diana, you are welcome into this space and we are extremely grateful to have all your brilliancy, these two, uh, four powerhouses into this space to be part of this conversation. So as you know, this will work on four segments. The first se segment is for us to, to witness you, to listen from you, what, uh, what is your background and what brought you here? And also what is your project? You know, what are you doing here in terms of this multicultural uh, media component that we are discussing? And I would like to invite um, Maran to start. How about if you, I know that I did not give justice to your bios. So I would like to invite each of you to tell us who you are and what have you been doing? So Maran, how about if you start? Thank you, Paula. Sri Lanka is a very Sri Lanka is a very small island, but full of natural resources. It is a blessed and beautiful place. It is my country. I was born into a loving and caring family. I was taught to care for all of humanity, and this also meant caring for my own people. As I reflect upon my life, and I have had Lots of, lots of time to reflect since I arrived in Canada. I realized how I was shaped by the reality of being a Tamil. Growing up Tamil had many positive aspects. It meant learning the discipline of the life, even from our mother's breast. My culture taught me gentleness and kindness. I grew up surrounded by natural beauty, the sun, the air, the plants surrounded me with lo loveliness. However, being a Tamil also affected where I lived as my family had to move many times for reasons that were not clear to me as a child. It determined where I could study and for how long. Being a Tamil meant that I grew up surrounded by violence and suffering. It almost seemed normal. As I grew up, I realized that my difficulties were not only mine, but were shared by all those who were Tamils. I wanted to do something to help my people and find a solution to their predicament. I wanted to study, to go to college, but even though the university education was free for all in Sri Lanka. It was much more restricted for Tamils. I had to pay my way, study my own, 
However, I was very motivated. The suffering of Tamils in Sri Lanka moved me work as a journalist. I saw that media was a way of showing the distress of my people to the world. I saw it is a way of protecting my people and bringing peace to my country. I was committed to this, but it became increasingly difficult as we faced horrible challenges. I began to work as a freelance journalist in 2002. One year later, I started a multimedia company that was considered the best source of independent news in the country. In 2009, there was a massive killing field in the safety zone in Northern Sri Lanka. Sometime it has been referred to as a Holocaust. There were more than 146,000 innocent Tamil civilians killed by Sri Lankan forces. This mass killing was carried out in front of the entire world, including the United Nations. This act of killing, regardless of age and gender, has breached all human rights and committed a crime against humanity itself. My media company told the truth about the cruelty. We did everything we could, and still the murder and the cruelty continue. Even the United Nations abandoned us. We were helpless. After a certain point, we lost the energy and the power to speak the truth and fight for our freedom. I knew many journalists, friends, and co-workers who had been killed for reporting the human rights violation in Sri Lanka. I had been under threat since 2004. However, in 2009, I was forced to decide when they threatened my life, my family. I paid a lot of money to some people in Thailand who promised me to take a country where I would be safe. I had no choice about where to go, only small hope that I would eventually be safe. But I never imagined that I would be forced to make board journey to Canada. I arrived in Canada in 2009 together with 75 other Tamil refugees on the now infamous MB Ocean Lady Boat. Yes, it was a journey to Canada without a map. After we faced terrible storms on the small ship and spent a month and a half on a voyage of the damned, but in the end, we were all arrested by the Canadian military. After four months in the Vancouver prison, we were released under strict condition amounting to house arrest. Thanks to help so many, after four years, I was accepted as a convention refugee in Canada on 2013 May. Then in 2016, I finally became a permanent resident. It took seven years, seven years of fear and anguish. I separated from my wife and daughter for seven years. To serve their lives, they, they were constantly on the run and in hiding for the first three years. Then they spent four years as a refugee in a third world country. There are no words to explain how I felt for those seven years. My daughter was constantly asking me, Dad, when are you going to take me to Canada? I wanted to sleep in your lap. I want to give you a hug. Sometimes she gave me big hugs and kisses on Skype. Every time I was speechless with tearful eyes. Her daughter may have outgrown her father's lap, but she will never outgrown her dad's heart. On August 2nd, 2016, an unforgettable day in my life and my miracle, my wife and daughter arrived in Canada. They were granted a temporary visa to come to Canada. It did not happen easily. Penn Canada and their members, including Paula, worked, help to, worked hard to help me. It is only due to their dedication and tireless effort that we are now together. Then my family blessed and welcome to additional members in Canada. 
I am grateful from the bottom of my heart to all people who helped to bring my family to Canada on 2016, especially Mary Joletti of Romero House and my lawyer, Andrew Brower, who supported me from the very beginning. My fight for justice and peace does not stop here. Now that I have my family by my side, I have strength and energy to continue this journey no matter what obstacles may come my way. Thank you. That's my story. Maran, thank you very much for, for sharing and for giving us a bit of the journey. And while you were talking uh, about that experience, particularly from the moment when, when you arrived to this long seven years and then the continuous waiting uh, until, until you were finally reunited with your wife and daughter. Uh, it just brought so many memories to, to my mind as well as many of us witnessed that journey, which was, was extremely heavy in, for, for Maran. We all witnessed that, the pain and the suffering and in, in, in the cry for, for, for support and help both of Maran here and also um, her, his wonderful family in wherever they were at, at a specific time because I remember they were moving from place to place. Um, I thank you for, for, for your courage and I thank you for continue being a voice for, for many others. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation that we will have as we dip into this very important question of voices and communities. I would like to give the space to Cynthia to share with us a little bit of um, her background and also her own journey. Thank you again, Cynthia, for being here. Thank you so much, Paola Musart, for the invitations. Congratulations for all the festival, for all the happening multicultural festival. I have to say that I'm so honored to be sharing this panel, to be sharing this conversation with my three other colleagues. I have done my research on all of you, and, and honestly, I do admire all you have done. Uh, you are brave. You are so, it's so important to have you here in Canada. Um, you are committed with your audience, and it's such an honor to, to be here sharing this virtual conversation uh, today. So a bit introduction about me. Um, I have been in Canada for six years. Um, actually, I have to say that for different circumstances, I was uh, that day that Maran shared with Pen Canada and with Writers in Exile that you were receiving your, your PR. Uh, and, and I remember that with a lot of joy. And I'm so happy now that you were uh, sharing all your journey. I, it, it also brought me those very, very important memories. So I came to Canada in 2015. Uh, I came here because I had the opportunity to continue my studies as a journalist, uh, in a specific as a, in, in digital journalism. My background in Mexico was mainly in radio and television. I was uh, covering politics at that time. So I moved to Canada six years ago. Uh, after my graduation here, uh, well, I, I was able to study at Sheridan College. So after my graduation, I continued my career as a digital journalist in a media outlet named TLN Television. This is a Canadian media outlet, which owns an, another Spanish-speaking outlet, the Spanish-speaking TV channel named Univision Canada. This is one of the uh, largest Spanish-speaking channels in North America. Um, after this, my experience working at TLN Television, I decided to create my own uh, media platform with my husband, who is also a journalist with over 20 years of experience. He's also from Mexico. And the name of our project is The Bridge Canada. I would love to share a bit more about uh, our digital platform. Uh, so we started The Bridge exactly a month before the pandemic started. Uh, what we want with our platform is to help immigrants in Canada to get more involved, to be part of Canadian society, 
and to develop this sense of belonging in Canada with with Canada with the new with their new home right which is a, their new their new country we are right now in a first stage as Paola was mentioning we are focused on the Latin American community that means that most of our content is in Spanish we do believe and we have seen exactly in these times in the pandemic how important it is to provide a content in our own language however i have to say that for us it's very important that our community our spanish speakers audience uh, understand that we live in a multicultural society as canada is so that's why uh, for, for us it's extremely important for me to be here surrounded by other journalists with different backgrounds because I, that's exactly what we want, to continue building bridges with other communities and help our Latin American community to cross that bridge and, and understand how multicultural is the Canadian society. Uh, so I would like to share a bit uh, more of what people can find on our platform. So we are bringing uh, news stories, news content, um, as mentioned in Spanish, about Canada, to be more specific about Ontario, to be more specific about Toronto and GTA, which is exactly where we are based right now. Uh, we are also telling success stories about immigrants. And the reason for, for this and, and why we are sharing these stories is because its representation matters and it's so important for immigrants to see ourselves, to see how other immigrants were able to get to the top and, and to feel inspired by them. It's so important for, for us that our community, that our people see role models out there so they can picture themselves. Um, just as an example, we recently told the story of a Mexican Canadian journalist named Carla Mesa. Carla Mesa uh, was uh, telling uh, stories for a, a very important newspaper named Le Devoir. And because of the work she was doing, she was covering stories about immigration, about refugees. She has been recognized as one of the most important journalists right now in, in Canada. Other topics of our agenda are also the temporary foreign workers who are coming every year to Canada from Mexico, from Guatemala and from other countries. We do believe this is, this is important uh, because they are part of the, in, the immigrants who live here in Canada and they are part of the Latin American community. So we, are, we have become a reliable source of information for them to learn more about some uh, issues, some topics around their sector, around their field, but also to learn about the country where they are living in. And uh, also for us, it's important to share with our audience way more about Canada. We are immigrants, so we don't know how, for example, to enjoy the winter, what, can, what other activities uh, you, can, you can do to, to enjoy uh, this kind of weather that we don't have in our countries. And we are also sharing a bit about a Canadian history, for example, the Victoria Day and so on. Why? Because we do believe that those are elements that can help our community to strive here in Canada. Thanks, Paola. Cynthia, thank you very much. And there is so much I can unpack from that conversation, from, from the experience of creating content as an immigrant for our community, right? So for our individual community, see, there is uh, the the Eritrean, the Ethiopian, or the or the Sri Lankan, or the uh, Romanian, or the Latin American, or you know any community as as a silo, or we create content that is of interest to everybody, right? And so, who determines what content is the interest for everybody? As well as there is such an important conversation as what it is to build those bridges, you know, how we create interest into communicating from community to community about what is important, particularly because we all belong to different diasporas. So thank you very much for that. I'm looking forward to that conversation. And now I would like to invite our dear friend Gesa, and I know I'm doing it wrong, Gesa. Um, 
no invite you we invite you to to uh, share with us your journey and and I know that I was recently uh, awarded uh, for his work as well but I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about his work before we go into the the deep of the conversation. Thank you very much, Paula and the Muse Arts for inviting me for this wonderful conversation. And uh, as you know, we are mourning the uh, days of our beloved friend and the chair of the Exile uh, Writers Group of Penn Canada, Aaron Brahane, an Eritrean brother, uh, friend. And uh, I would like to express my sympathy for his family's friends uh, again. Uh, saying that, uh, I would like to start my, my, you know, introducing myself as an Ethiopian journalist and filmmaker and writer. And uh, as you know, Ethiopia is an ancient country located in the Horn of Africa. Uh, in is an ancient land, stunning landscape and mind-boggling architecture, uh, such as the 12th century churches of Lalibala, each carved from single uh, piece of rock and uh, the 3.2 million year old bipedal upright female hominine skeleton, uh, Lucy, uh, if you know her. And uh, Ethiopia is uh, a country in Africa, uh, which is uncolonized and uh, with its own uh, scripts. And uh, growing in this beautiful country in the capital city of Addis Ababa, I was uh, captivated by you know, uh, media and art as a young uh, man. And the level of uh, the social polit political problem of my country at that time when I was in Ethiopia was very deep and it, was, it made me sick. And the only way I got as a remedy to, to vent this pain was writing and uh, involving in, in the media. And I was only 19 years old when I first published my, my first uh, newspaper, uh, which was a neighborhood newspaper uh, focusing on reproductive health. And it, it was uh, under the umbrella of a, uh, a club, a reproductive health club. Since then, uh, I'm in media, still writing, publishing and producing, even as an exile. And as uh, Paula said at uh, uh, the beginning, I awarded uh, a community championship award from uh, the MP Arivarani office recently, and I was awarded the Ethnic Media and Press Council of Ca Canada uh, award uh, a year before. And uh, after I came to Canada, I started publishing a trilingual community newspaper uh, entitled New Perspective in Amharic, uh, we call it Adiskenit. Uh, which exactly means a uh, new perspective. And it's not easy to establish uh, media as a newcomer and as an exile. As you know, it's very uh, complex to be as a, uh, an exile uh, and uh, to, to start a new business, a, a new job. Throughout, uh, through time, my community newspaper evolved uh, into a broadcasting media and now we are publishing uh, a digital version of our uh, trilingual newspaper. We produce a weekly radio show and podcast uh, with Regent Radio, uh, Black Community Radio, and a YouTube channel uh, with my wife and my partner, Sosin Nashan Nafi, which, uh, uh, which uh, she was there uh, from the very inception of our media when she was even in, in Ethiopia. She was contributing, editing, uh, from uh, back home. Uh, once uh, in a while, I'm producing uh, and making films in collaboration with as, other media companies like uh, Rombus Media and uh, Primitive Entertainment. Uh, which these uh, companies are a very prestigious companies in uh, producing uh, documentaries and feature films in Canada. So far, I made three short uh, films in Canada. The recent one is focusing on exile artists. It's uh, titled Tzita, which means memories. Uh, it's about a nostalgic uh, memory of, uh, you know, any of us, uh, not only uh, artists. Uh, 
And uh, two, uh, I worked, I, I made this uh, film with uh, CBC Canada and Rhombus Media and Primitive Entertainment. Tazata is also a story of exile artists who tried to stay afloat in the artistic landscape of uh, their new country. And as a media, uh, Bridge Entertainment, which is our uh, company's name, and we, uh, under the auspice of Bridge Entertainment, we publish, we broadcast, and we, made, uh, we, made, we are making films. Our vision and mission is clear, which is to make a bridge between cultures and uh, to be a voice for the marginalized uh, communities, both in Canada and uh, in Ethiopia and in Africa. That's why our motto runs through media, we build uh, bridges, not walls. Uh, in Toronto and Canada, our newspaper, uh, radio and podcast and YouTube channel uh, meant to bring together the Ethiopian and Eastern African diaspora. Uh, our media company reports news from home and also gives back to Ethiopians their voices that was previously silenced by the authoritarian government. And because of all, because of all this uh, economic and language and cultural barriers, refugee and newcomers who can't receive news and content from the mainstream media use our uh, media outlets as an alternative media, we are filling the gap uh, that uh, the, the gap or the media niche that the mainstream media can't cover. And uh, we are working with Ethnic Media and Press Council of Canada as well in collaboration with other community media platforms. And uh, we are trying to, 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 you know, to bridge cultures and values, not only in Canada, uh, even across Canada, because we are living in a very uh, universal and uh, globalized world. So uh, what happened in Canada in affects uh, in Ethiopia, in Africa, or uh, in Latin America, or elsewhere. So we are trying to to do that. Uh, uh, and my wife uh, Sosenna is also a uh, very uh, great journalist and writer. She is the backbone of uh, our media so uh, and i'm writing uh, short stories and poems and articles and when i get time i publish uh, in medias back in ethiopia and uh, in canada too and i'm an active member of pen canada uh, because my uh, journey uh, my my reason to come to canada is pain because i'm fighting for uh, human rights and uh, freedom of expression back in Ethiopia, uh, as we establish Pen Ethiopia with my colleagues, uh, and uh, because of uh, the very suppressive policy of the, the Zen government uh, in Ethiopia, they didn't allow us to 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 you know to be a voice for a voiceless. So finally, we uh, we came to Canada and we stay here, and uh, now. We are uh, working with uh, exile writer groups like Paula and uh, Elmaran and other friends. Uh, that's it uh, to start with. <laughs> Thank you very much. I told you a powerhouse. It is absolutely a powerhouse. Thank you very much for sharing all these perspectives that go from, from your experience, but also with all the resiliency that is in you and that you have done all these other things and you have I'm sure that you have even more ideas in your head and more things that you want to do, and we are looking forward to hear them all. Um, and now I want to welcome our dear friend. Um, we have worked with Diana, and again, Diana, Diana, and happening before us, she's a poet, she's a writer, uh, but we also know that she's a journalist and has done a very important work and of journalism uh, through the Romanian community. And so we welcome you uh, into this space. And again, it's, what, it's such an honor to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's true, it is. I am so impressed uh, uh, with the work my, my fellow panelists are doing. And thank you very much, Paola, for 
organizing this uh, amazing festival. I was a poet in 2019, and I'll talk a bit more in the second segment. May I share my screen? I made the PowerPoint. Yes, go for it. You can share your screen. Wonderful. See, I... Um, uh, I am very happy this multicultural festival exists. And uh, I came to Canada uh, almost over 20 years ago. And uh, I came as a journalist. And uh, right now I am freelancing in journalism, although my uh, main work is in scholarship poetry, translating, and teaching. I have prepared this little PowerPoint for you uh, all, for you, for the audiences, because I believe in the power of images. And um, I will talk more about what I'm doing in Canada in the second segment. I started at 16. As you probably know, uh, Romania was under Ceausescu's regime until 1999. It was one of the most terrible communist dictatorship in uh, Europe. And uh, we did not have freedom of speech. We did not have the freedom to write the truth. One of the things we have done was to counterbalance political oppression through culture. I first worked on the high school magazine as both a writer and an editor. And I was very sentimental yesterday when I found the picture of my former high school online because I was four years on, on these hallways. And I included the name of the high school as a reflection of history. It is now called the Central School in Bucharest. When I was a student there before 1999, it was called Zoya Kosmodemianskaya. It had the name of a Soviet hero. Before communism, it was the Royal School for Girls. As you can see, politics is embedded in our, and as you know, is embedded in our, every, our everyday lives at any levels. Uh, as a student before and after uh, the fall of communism, I was very active as a, a print journalist. I won the Young Theatre Prize for Young Journalists. I published lots of uh, cu current affairs stories, interviews, literary reviews in st student in cultural uh, magazines. I worked for uh, radio, the Romanian National Radio Broadcasting Corporation. The most important, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the most consistent thing I have done as a journalist uh, in Romania was being working for TVRI, for TV Romania International. At that time, it was the only television channel that uh, broadcast uh, in, uh, internationally. Uh, it was a channel designed for, Roman for the Romanian diaspora. I was a TV producer there for three years. And in my last uh, year uh, in Romania, I was an executive producer. And uh, I think you will understand me because I had troubles uh, uh, making Canadians understand that Romania was still very poor at that time. We paid a few people and made them work a lot. Uh, so I was in charge of 26 TV shows. I had to supervise the production. I had to watch the uh, final show. And it was me who, who signed them literally on a piece of paper to have them on air as an executive producer. I, um, that's a list you can see there on the show, on the slide. I also designed uh, as an executive producer, I designed uh, one 
I think it was the only live to call-in show uh, at TV Romania International at the time, cultural polemics, where people from Romanians from all over the world were able to call in and talk to very important cultural, social, and political personalities at the time. One of the very interesting things as a producer was that I traveled to the Netherlands, Germany, and Israel and produced in investigative documentaries about the Romanian diaspora living in those countries uh, before knowing that one day I will become part of the Romanian diaspora. At that time, I wasn't thinking to immigrate. Now, among the I also went to Hungary. You might know that uh, Romania has a border with Hungary and uh, uh, the Western part of Romania uh, was part of the Austro-Hungarian empire. And we have a, a lot of ethnic Hungarians living in uh, Ardal. And we also have a lot of ethnic Romanians living in, in uh, Hungary. You know how political borders do not consider individuals, but states. Now, the dearest to me a show I created as a producer was what I called at the time the moment, uh, the second of poetry. And this was uh, 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 the uh, beginning of the show. And uh, I had produced over 70 of those. It was a weekly show and uh, I was featuring a poet every week. And uh, I was very sentimental searching for images yesterday. I was the one who hired the designer for the logo of the Tevere, the one you can still see here on the screen. I came to Canada for family reasons. I was a single mother. Uh, my sister came to Canada. My parents followed her. And I decided to come here and uh, uh, be with them on the same continent. They are now in Ottawa. Uh, when I arrived, I wasn't, well, basically I had a, my image of Canada was very different from reality. So I went back to school. According to what my professor told me, even two years ago, I was the first, and it seems still only, immigrant to earn a master in broadcast journalism. Um, my master's project was a documentary, which was called Canadian Smile. And it was a 30 minute uh, uh, television documentary. Uh, I was coming from a sad country where uh, post-communist transition was extremely disappointing. And when I came to Canada and I so people smiling on the streets, I was in awe. And this short documentary explores from several perspectives, the Canadian smile. I talked to a dentist, to a historian, to a psychologist and so on. In addition uh, uh, to that, I am now freelancing as a journalist. Uh, as Paola know, I published in Romanian magazine Observatoru, but I also published in a few English language uh, magazines. And I believe, like you all said, that multicultural media is a form of cultural translation and inclusion. I am confident that we can build bridges. We can build bridges between immigrant communities and Canada, the, our new country. And in addition, we can 
built bridges among ourselves. And I will uh, uh, show you uh, uh, later how I have tried to do this. This is one of the articles published in Now Magazine. I am most proud of it was as early as 2015 when they uh, published for Canada Day, putting, putting the accent on citizenship. I have done social uh, research. I have explored how different accents impact the stat status, the treatment of people in Canada. As you can see in uh, uh, the sentences I put in bold, it's not just about immigrant accents. I have discovered that even Aboriginal accents lead to discrimination on the phone. And the question I have asked at that time was, and I'm still asking, which is the re real Canadian English accent? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for giving us this perspective as well and for sharing your uh, wonderful journey as well, because it's a journey with you know, as many of the journeys of all of us, you know, with, with obstacles and challenges, but also so much elements in which you now see it and feel proud about all the, all the achievements in, in the processes. So uh, I feel very, very grateful for uh, receiving the gift of your, of your journeys into this space. And as we continue with this um, conversation, I want um, to invite us all to further discuss something that you already make reference to. And it's the fact that as quote, alternative media and this idea of competing with the mainstream media, right? So what is out there? What, what is the narrative that is presented? What are the news that are relevant in a very Eurocentric, very, very colonized uh, society that is feeding us with information that sometimes is to as relevant as the information that our communities require and deserve, particularly as being, just talking about the case of Toronto, the most multicultural city on the world. One will think that all that happens around us will have an impact on our communities because we're part of diasporas. If I think of what is happening right now in, in Colombia, and I'm not hearing much in the mainstream media about what's happening in Colombia. Or I recall, I, I truly recall when Mara will send us all this information about what's happening, the genocide that was happening in, in Sri Lanka. There was no information anywhere about what was going on. And, and I know that the list is very long. So I will invite, and I, I will just go back uh, to the order that we started with. Uh, to place this question, to propose this question of is the mainstream media representing the voices of our communities? And sometimes that could be from the perspective of, uh, of a person of color or a journalist of color being part of the mainstream media, or it could be from our perspective of alternative medias, multicultural medias, ethnic media that bring uh, information. So. Uh, you take that question in any way you want, and I would like to invite uh, Maran to answer that. Is this mainstream media representing and giving voice to the needs of your needs and the needs of the communities that you work with? Yeah, I need to mention and uh, highlight a few things at this point. Uh, first of all, just um, uh, what is journalism? So according to the American Press Institute, journalism is the activity of uh, gathering, assigning and creating and presenting news and the information. It is also the product of these activities. But in 2009, when the bloody war happened in Sri Lanka, Northern Sri Lanka, the Canadian Tamils diasporas raised their voice through the parliament 
and the local uh, bodies. There were also massive demonstration in front of the House of Commons in Ottawa and the Legislative Assembly of Ontario in Queen's Park. There was a human chain protest in Toronto for two days in late January 2009, I think, yeah. The Tamil diaspora requested the international bodies to put the political pressure on Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka to stop the deadly war. But the mainstream media did not represent the Tamil community. But some media and journalists wrongly profiled, wrongly profiled their pain, the loss in Sri Lanka. Even though in recently, on May 6th, the Bill 104, Tamil Genocide Education Week Act, the private bill passed third reading in the Ontario legislature. This act established seven days each year, May 11th to 18th, during which Ontarians are encouraged to educate themselves about and to maintain their awareness of the Tamil genocide and other genocide that have occurred in uh, around the world. This was the first jurisdiction in the world to recognize a genocide against Tamils in Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, only few mainstream media outlets give their platform to air this news to Canadian. The second thing, what is refugee? In 1951, Refugee Convention spell out that refugees is someone who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reason of race, religion, nationality, membership of particular social group, political opinion, is outside the country of, the, of his nationality and is unable to, or uh, owing such a fear, is unwilling to avail it himself of the protection of the country. This definition is the legal definition, but nowadays some people are trying to change the definition of the refugee for their own agenda. When it came to Canada on a boat with 75 other Sri Lankan Tamils in 2009, we were labeled in the way as illegal immigrant, as terrorist travelers, as a Tamil migrant tide, and bogus refugees, mm -hmm. as phony refugees. Mm -hmm. this, happen this happened under the Kabul government. Mm -hmm. I asked myself before and after we arrived, a genocide has occ occurring in Sri Lanka. As I mentioned, more than 146,000 Tamil civilians were murdered in 2009 alone by the Sri Lankan government. Is the Canadian government blind to this killing? Why did the media not clarify what dangers we faced at home? Without our permission, the mainstream media was giving a title that hurts as deeply. Mm. After you listened to my story, and now you understood my heartfelt pain. Mm -hmm. Maran, thank you so much because I think you have, you have specifically given us an example of how the mainstream media can be so harmful to communities, you know, stigmatizing, perpetrating an idea, a wrong idea. And when, you know, when the truth comes to light, the ratification, the way in which they they don't even apologize. They just put that at the like at the back of the of the paper or at the hour that nobody watches or simply just keep silence. And so the thing that stays in communities is still the stigmatization that had been fed by what the mainstream media uh, produces. Um, I thank you very much for uh, offering that clear explanation of how harmful a mainstream media can be, um, not only to misinform, but also to produce real harm into people's bodies and in, in communities because this type of information that is produced not only stigmatizes but produces hate, produces 
elements in which will turn them to violence. And we have seen that happening to so many times. I thank you for offering this into, uh, for your very outspoken. And I know that you have always been very outspoken. That's how I had witnessed you for the um, last, um, oh my gosh, it's going to be almost a decade. Okay, I'm not gonna start counting there. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Cynthia, what is your perspective in the question that we're placing here? Or your reaction, your comment? Absolutely, Paola. Answering that question, if we, if we consider, we think that mainstream media accurately represent our audience, let's say immigrants, refugees, I would uh, right away say no, I, I don't think so. And, and I do believe that there are like many reasons for that. I would like to highlight one in a specific, and it's that we don't have we immigrants don't have representation in the newsroom where people are making the decisions on which stories to cover. So that's to me the main reason why a story as the one Maran was uh, sharing didn't get to, to, the, to the news or they didn't have the correct approach because we as immigrants are not part of those newsroom, newsrooms where the decisions are being, being making. And I don't want to take this in a, in a wrong way. I'm not saying that we all immigrants should be <laughs> directing those newsrooms, but of course should be a representation of the society we live in. Just as you were mentioning when you were giving this introduction, right? Here in Toronto, Toronto the most multicultural city in the whole world, mm -hmm. 50, more than 50% of the population were born outside Canada. But if you ask a journalist how many people of color and how many people from other uh, countries, immigrants are in those new rooms, mm -hmm. how many? Not so many, right? And I can tell you just ab about my experience as a journalism student here in Canada. The immigrants in my, in my news class were 20%. And from those, that 20%, small group of 20% for people, only two of us continue doing journalism and we are focusing on ethnic media mm -hmm. uh, outlets. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's such a big challenge for sure. And I would say the representation should not only come to those people who are making the decisions, but also on camera. So I would like to ask you, and, and this is uh, related with what Diana was mentioning, how many of you has, have seen host, you know, like uh, people giving news, to the Canadian, to the whole Canadian society with an accent. How many, I, I mean, we are also part of the society and we, like if, if in Toronto you can hear every single day that many languages, you should be able to hear uh, an immigrant giving news to the Canadian society, why not, right? Mm -hmm. So for sure we need a way more diverse or a way more diversity in our newsroom. Otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that this is not gonna happen. So just as an example, I would like to tell, uh, to talk about Ginella Massa. Ginella is the first woman wearing a hijab on national Canadian television to just become the, the, a, a new host of, of CBC. So she's the first woman, only until 2021, Canada was able to have on screen, on camera, uh, a woman wearing a, a hijab. So just this as an, as an example, right? Um, so now it, that's why I would say media outlets like the ones we are all um, participating at are extremely, extremely important because we are giving voices to our communities. And I would say not only talking about a multicultural media, but also talking about multicultural journalists. We all are multicultural journalists. It's, it's extremely important to continue building bridges among us, but also to start building bridges with those other uh, journalists who are part of the, of the mainstream media who might help at some point to share a story that is affecting our community. I have seen, I have seen that Maran, uh, my, my colleague Gesan, 
Diana, uh, Diana has, has been publishing in Now Magazine, right? So we are starting to have a little bit of representation there. We should continue there. If, if, if Maran is able to tell a story, at least to one journalist in the mainstream media, we, we need to continue opening that door and continue having that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there is a lot of potential for media outlets like us because there is a need. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, with that need, of course, um, it's coming a lot of other challenges, mm -hmm. uh, such as, for example, uh, how we uh, educate our audience to let them know that what we are doing is community journalism. So we also need to, to receive the support of them to continue existing. Another big challenge, of course, is going to be the monetization, how we make this visible, how we can make a living for this, it's, it's, it's such a challenge for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say, as, as I was mentioning uh, before, another challenge that we're facing is bridging our communities, right? To let them know that it's not only talking about our own issues as Latinos, it's understanding that we are part of Canada, of a minority in this case, of immigrants. So absolutely, we need to continue mm -hmm. building those other bridges with other communities. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, thank you very much for that. And for those who probably know, know my, my style, I will say, why not? Why are not we the, the majority in those, mm -hmm. in those uh, newsrooms? Because if we are over the 50% of uh, the population in, in, the, in, in, in these communities, why is it that the representation does not, is not equal in terms of those percentages in those spaces? And the other part that really resonated about having to go to someone else to tell our stories again is like, why not we telling our stories, you know, rather than having Maran uh, telling the story to another journalist to tell the story, why not to have Maran telling that story? And I think that is, that is um, such an important element and I really welcome everything that you mentioned, Cynthia, because it is so powerful from uh, analyzing that a lot of the obstacles are also raised in our own communities, you know? this idea of uh, sophistication that comes associated to an accent or the lack of one. For some reason, even for our communities, if we carry with these beautiful accents of ours, there is, there is a, 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 an idea of no good enough, no, no knowledgeable enough, which is, uh, which is fed by what we see on, on the screen, what we see, what we hear in the radio, that are these very polished, English words that did really only represent less than 40% of the population that lives here, right? Because we all have some sort of beautiful accent in what I always, and you remember this is a, this is a campaign in the Latin American community and it is having an accent is cool because that means that you at least speak two language. So mm -hmm. it's having an accent is something to be proud of. So thank you very much, Cynthia, for sharing this perspective is such an important one. Um, now I'm passing the, the, the spotlight to our Fred Gesad to share um, his perspective on this theme and your reactions, of course. I'm looking forward to hear them. <laughs> you know, what can I say? You already said it. So uh, to add some, some more uh, points, you know, running a community media or a multicultural media is, is not an easy job. It's not an easy task, but a very, you know, it needs a lot of work. The challenge uh, comes from within and without, like you said. The, from within, uh, we have, we lack uh, resources, you know, we financially uh, and uh, professionally. We have to equip our uh, staff with uh, the up-to-date, you know, knowledge and uh, technology. Uh, and from, from without, we we have this systemic uh, problem that we are facing, uh, and historically, you know, especially in the marginalized com communities, the black communities, the indigenous communities are facing the systemic problem. So, uh, with 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 this problem uh, in place. How can we uh, create a vibrant uh, multicultural media? How can we take it forward? How can we move it forward? It's very tough. We do whatever we can uh, to, to roll the, the ball uh, so far, but uh, still we need uh, 
some kind of support from the other Canadians who understand the systemic problem very well and from the policymakers. We need a practical policy support and, you know, uh, legal support. Otherwise, it's, uh, you know, wordy and uh, nothing can be changed. So, uh, so far from my experience, when I first come to, came to Canada, I start learning what's happening around me and around my community. And our community has no uh, vibrant media. Uh, even, you know, five years back uh, when I arrived here, uh, the focus and uh, focuses entirely about uh, community. This, you know, media. You're muted. You, you just you just mute yourself. I move my hand. Sorry, yeah. sorry for that. No, and, you're uh, so excited that you you just press there. That's okay. Yes, Go ahead. Yes, that yes. <laughs> and uh, when I. Uh, first arrived in Canada, I learned that uh, our, our community has no vibrant media. So uh, I was thinking how to uh, establish a media that could be uh, an outlet for, for this closed community, for this, you know, uh, marginalized community. So the community, in the community level, we have so many issues to be addressed. Uh, and which are ignored by the, 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 main, the mainstream medias. News and stories are, I know, uh, based on uh, individual uh, medias and uh, newsworthy is based on the individual medias. So what's worthy, is not, what's worthy for local media is not worthy for the mainstream media, mm -hmm. but still we can, we can cr create a kind of bridge, a kind of collaboration to share stories among the mainstream and the local media. Mm -hmm. And news and, uh, but we didn't get that chance. I know that there are some, uh, some uh, you know, uh, some experiences here and there, like uh, for instance, public medias like CBC are trying to, like my friend uh, mentioned uh, it earlier, uh, trying to be inclusive and trying to bring faces to the mainstream media, which is a good start, but it's not enough. You so, know, it's not enough. Uh, we, they have to do it more. They have to open up the space for people from uh, various uh, community members and diverse groups. Mm -hmm. So that brings the real story into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. For instance, the main uh, stream media reports on uh, African countries or Latin American countries mm -hmm. using, you know, uh, an increased, uh, you know, an unreliable sources. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, taking news from an unreliable uh, source, they can use local medias as their uh, new source as their story source because we are the one working with our communities and with our uh, original countries we have we have the root uh, source and the real source so if we collaborate we can provide them uh, uh, fresh and you know reliable stories mm -hmm. so that creates a bridge between the mainstream and the local media mm -hmm. and that makes canada even a diverse and you know a functional country but i don't know where this uh, starts and who can do it i have no idea maybe uh, at the end of uh, this uh, conversation uh, people who focuses on policy can can take the idea and work on that mm -hmm. but i am thinking there must be some kind of bridge the mainstream media and the local medias and but it's not easy uh, to run a news company in our level, in a community level, mm -hmm. it's not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes one person or two person can run the whole thing, mm -hmm. the publishing, the distribution, uh, the advertisement. Mm -hmm. Even you are an accountant, you are uh, a news uh, editor and you are a reporter, you are uh, everything. Mm -hmm. That plays a negative role 
on the quality of a news or a, on the quality of a story that you are providing. So this, uh, this is another challenge uh, in the local and multicultural mm -hmm. uh, media. And, uh, but still uh, good hearted people who understand the situation are trying to support uh, local medias. I know there are uh, great people who knows uh, supporting local medias, multicultural medias is supporting the Canadian cause, mm -hmm. the multicultural value. So they are uh, trying to work with the local medias, but uh, still it's a very uh, insignificant uh, number. So we have to push forward to, to change this. And the other thing is the mainstream medias are, uh, as Maran earlier said, are victims of uh, misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. Recently, I can, I can say on CBC, uh, there was a report about Ethiopia and uh, the reporter uh, was uh, reporting about uh, the northern part where the conflict is in, in Tigray. There is a conflict, there, is, uh, there are so many problems there, but she is trying to, to tell the story from the one group's point of view. Mm. There is no balance. This is mm. the ABC of journalism. Mm -hmm. If a reporter makes a story, he has to balance it from both sides. Mm -hmm. So how could you, as a professional journalist, how could you tell a story from one person's point of view or from one group point of view? Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody has to tell you how to, how to make a, a news. Mm -hmm. And the editor who is receiving the news here has to ask and has to balance it, has to ask where she get that, that information from. And if there is any balance, but see, he didn't do it. So this causes, you know, uh, a confusion among uh, communities who are living uh, in exile. And they are trying to suspect what the mainstream media is uh, feeding us. Yep. Why they do that? What's the reason behind? Where is the journalism? Yes. That's a question. Yes. So we, we have to uh, ask this question and the, the mainstream media has to uh, consider their practice again, has to revise their practice again mm -hmm. and has to collaborate with the local media. Mm -hmm. That's a better way uh, I'm proposing in this uh, multicultural media platform. Absolutely. I think and I think something that you make reference to collaboration working together, you know, working collectively. And I hope out of this conversation uh, comes the idea of, of, you know, how these uh, powerhouses, the powerhouses that you are as leaders, as, as uh, journalists that work in multicultural ethnic media, uh, that actually you come together and create, you know, those and demand those changes in, in, in put forward you know, elements of advocacy to be able to move this agenda forward because it's so important in everything, every single aspect that each of you have touched on is crucial. And I think they should be part of like a big list of demands in, in, in um, complaints to, to the mainstream media and those, those who uh, fund them because a lot of these mainstream media has uh, government funding and as I don't know if you are aware of this, I'm 100% sure you are, and is that there is an entire law that, that requires government support to uh, multicultural or ethnic media. It's actually by law because of the ca Canada's views and perspectives on multiculturalism, right? And so, uh, so sometimes that sounds more like a trendy word than something that people actually work on, but so I'm just leaving it up to you all leaders in the, in the, in the, in the media, in the multicultural media, to take on that that uh, fight as well that is so important. And I'm going to, I'm very mindful of the time, but this conversation is so wonderful that uh, I, I have I have very, um, probably uh, without asking permission to any of you that we were gonna pass uh, a, the three 
p.m. as originally planned, so I, I ask for your uh, forgiveness on that. And I'm going to pass the floor to uh, Diana to share her perspective in what we're going to do next is that we're going to go as how we move forward, right? And so that will be our way to conclude our panel. But Diana, the space is yours, and please enlighten us with your knowledge and wisdom as well. I will uh, uh, pick up where I stopped because uh, I have a, a similar experience. So I, I wrote this article because, because of accent, what I call accent discrimination. And uh, uh, when I was doing my master's at Carlton, so I, I did two internships, one with CTV Ottawa uh, in the newsroom and one with uh, uh, TV Ontario. And I was, so I went, uh, we shot a story and I was with the uh, uh, edit, editor editing the story and it was coming along because I had four years of TV experience before coming to Canada. And I heard one of the producers saying, producers saying, she has an accent, but she tell, she knows how to tell a story. I'm sure you can imagine how I felt if I didn't forget it, uh, forget it after uh, 20 years. So I, I applied for many, many jobs after I finished my master's in journalism. I had only one job interview and nothing happened. It's silly, like I went for my, I have a PhD from the University of Toronto. And when I feel sorry for myself, I think I have, being a scholar and the university professor are my survivor jobs because I wanted to be a journalist and I just, it, it didn't happen. And that's why I continued my studies. And as a scholar, I wrote about accent discrimination and uh, about what happens to other people who use language as their medium, like foreign actors who are unable to perform on Canadian stages, even though so many of Canadians have an accent. And I will just speaking about mainstream media, I just want to add one nuance and that is what we call today tokenism. Sometimes, I mean, I talked to someone from the HR 15 years ago after my job, my failed job interview at the CBC newsroom. And he was as bitter as myself about hiring uh, great journalists, visible minorities, how they call them, uh, born in Canada, just to, you know, to be able to check mark that they do cover, they respond to the Multiculturalism Act and how they just don't want to, to hire immigrants. Because I didn't apply to be a host. I, I applied to be on the research teams of the agenda in the newsroom and so on and so on. And I just couldn't break through. And I was sad to tell you the truth. Now I want to go back to media, uh, uh, multicultural media in Canada Probably you know about Canadian Immigrant, the magazine, the monthly magazine, which is free in, uh, in Toronto uh, on the street. And I mentioned before the fact that as journalists, we can also uh, mediate, act as intercultural mediators among various uh, communities uh, in Canada. And this was, uh, 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 when I feature, as you can see on the screen, poets from Nigeria, Iran, China, and India. And it was a great feeling to know that I was able to bring those poets together to somehow intro introduce them to each other, and then introduce them 
as a group to Canadian readers. I want to make one more point. point. I mean, I have a, a couple of more points. Uh, this is the second article I am very, very proud of, also published in Now. And it was about the uh, NICAB the, uh, uh, debate. And Cynthia just mentioned that finally we are going to have a, a journalist with uh, a hijab on, a, on Canadian television. And I want to, uh, I hope you will agree, to point out that what I would call immigrant freedom. We left a lot of us uh, endured oppression, political oppression in our home countries, which happened to me until 1989. We also uh, were forced or had the courage to start, to start a new life in a new country. And I think both that we have somehow more existential courage we also have uh, what I call immigrant freedom. And also, I think we have a different cultural sensitivity because we are, uh, we are brooded to we ourselves. We don't take everyday realities for granted. So in my view, basically, we can somehow act as cultural sensitivity trainers, because we are more sensitive to important aspects of everyday lives, which are new to us, but which people born here take for granted. And as a journalist, I wasn't, I never fought just for the rights of Romanian communities. I felt the duty to fight for human rights and women's rights in general. Uh, I will briefly uh, talk about media non-official languages, uh, about community journalists. I uh, published in Observatoru, the uh, Romanian language magazine, uh, print and online from Toronto, which goes to uh, Romanians in Canada and the US. I will not repeat uh, uh, what you have said because I, I agree it celebrates multicultural, um, multicultural media celebrates um, and built bridges. It also nurtured a feeling of belonging to a community in diaspora, which is very important. And it also provides social inclusion despite possible uh, barriers. Uh, one, the first article here is about the census. And I, I wrote it uh, uh, as thinking it was my civic duty as a Canadian to explain to Romanians who left before the fall of communism and basically help them understand why the census is important. Uh, in 9, 2019, I did write another article about a Romanian painter, which was featured at Happening and Paola knows she helps me. She helped me with material. The last point I want to make is slightly self-critical because, uh, you know, at least I will just talk about Romanian communities. Uh, Romanian communities in Canada, uh, some of the people immigrated before 1989 some of them carried the legacy of communism in terms of prejudices. Some of them could still worry that uh, everyone else is a KGB uh, agent. Some of them have prejudices. And last year in, in April, at the beginning of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, of course, I was aware of the anti-Asian uh, uh, races that was you know, exacerbated 
by COVID-19. And it is true, some of the Romanians, uh, you know, listened to Trump and called the COVID-19 virus the Chinese virus. And some of them have those anti-Asian sentiments, both in Canada and in Romania. And what I have done last year in April was to translate a few poems written by an amazing poet from Beijing and write my article was called Seeking Normality, Revolting, Rebelling Against Prejudices and try to help Romanians make the distinction between the state and the, and the individual. We cannot forget that. And I think as journalists, we have to remember that individuals and governments are two different things. Thank you very much. And I'm going to publish her in Romania too. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing this and also giving us these additional perspectives because at many times, and I do the same, we, we, uh, we remove this uh, self-analysis uh, and self-reflection from the conversations of community. The fact that there is still so much to work in relation to, to biases, to how even we perpetrate that stereotypes for other communities, you know, based on based on race, religion, uh, back, cultural background, accents, etc., etc., etc. So I think, thank you for bringing this, Diana. I think it's extremely crucial that when we are talking about holding holding uh, communities, we are both holding communities in the spaces of celebration, but we're also holding communities in the spaces of accountability and education. And so that this is why it's so crucial of the work that um, multicultural media does in that we definitely through this conversation identify that our needs, the needs of our communities. And here we have, you know, a, a beautiful display of very diverse communities in that we all agree that our communities are not being served properly to our the mainstream media and that multicultural media outlets are not receiving the supports that are required to be able to do the work. It, something else that I heard from this conversation is the fact that each one of you as leaders in, in, in your communities and through your outlets are also welcoming collaborations and even working with the well, with the mainstream media to to uh, resolve to fix the issues and to truly create the spaces that are inclusive and respectful of each member of the community. Because guess what, we talk about Canadians, but we are Canadians as well, right? Like it's not them and us. We are part of this and we are part of this community. So so this idea of them Canadian is like wait a second. Who are they? Because I am part of they and us. So we have just a few minutes. It, we already know how you love to talk. And of course, all the wisdom that comes from your, for, from, from your voices. But I would like to end this conversation by asking each one of you to give us a, you know, a, small, um, a, a small sentence or a small line in how we move forward. Of course, I will share with you internally your emails because I think I sense here the power of collective work among of all of you, but how we move forward to, to create spaces of truly inclusion where our needs, or the needs of our communities are actually met. Um, Maran, and, and I place the difficult question on you first. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. And also, we have to think about how we are going to move forward. Yeah. So we have to hold the hand. We need to create a, a, a strong network in this uh, country through the, uh, the visible minority mm -hmm. and other stuff. And we need to take these, all these uh, stories to the front line and how important and that's the way we can educate the Canadians uh, how our struggles and how we are building our life from the uh, from the bottom level. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. And again, I, I keep hearing the generosity, you know, and the willingness to work together. So thank you very much for that, Maran. 
uh, it has been an honor to have you in this space and have you been part of Happening Multicultural uh, this afternoon. How about you, Cynthia? Well, Paola, I would say, yes, please share those emails. I would love to collaborate with all of my colleagues. I, I do believe that we are stronger together. Uh, my audience is in Canada as well. They speak Spanish and I would love them to know a little bit more on what's going on in Sri Lanka, Ethiopia and so on. So, so I think this is such a, a possibility for us to share that content uh, to our audience. And I would add, um, things are changing slightly. Uh, I would say, let's continue. We as journalists, we are bridges. So let's continue knocking those doors because there are some journalists in the mainstream uh, media outlets who are opening those doors. So let's continue there because we, it's, it's also part of a thing that we can continue doing. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for that. Absolutely. Uh, definitely for some people like probably like me that want things like fast. Uh, I want more movement, like things are going very slow, but I also know that the power of these spaces is that we can create together uh, opportunities in spaces in which we start changing the discourse, start changing the narrative. And this is the power of this type of spaces. So Cynthia, thank you so much for bringing your energy and your talent into this space as well. It's such an honor to have you here in this platform and have you been part of Happening Multicultural. Um, I also want to share that The Bridge Canada is our official media sponsor for Happening Multicultural 2021. So Cynthia, thank you very much for that. Uh, how about you, Gesset? How is this for you? How you move forward? How we move forward? Move forward. We are moving forward. Of, of course, we are not, you know, we, we didn't stop. We have to show our effort. And thank you very much, Musart and uh, Paula and my uh, panelist friends. Uh, it's a wonderful platform. And uh, we are, to move forward, we have to use the power at hand. That's our media. Yes. That's a cultural media. We have the power. We, have, we don't, we don't uh, you know, underestimate it. It's a power. We are representing uh, millions. So we have to use this media and collaborate with the mainstream media. We don't have to shy away. We don't have to, uh, you know, uh, expect from uh, others. Let's move forward, do our part, and let's collaborate with, with others. That's what I want, I want to say. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that. And thank you for your energy. I can feel it. I'm like, yeah, yes, sure. You move. Yes, let us all move forward. So I can feel it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that is extremely powerful. And I do, again, hear from all of you the importance of collaboration, the importance of, of uh, cross cultural um, spaces, the importance of getting together and probably. Next time we need to do, uh, you know, explore a topic, you know, and let's explore this topic from the different perspectives and see what happened in terms of like specific things. Thank you so much for that. You know, you are giving me ideas. Don't start me there because I think I'm from, I'm from the same group of Getsat. We do things all at the same time. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Such an honor having you here. Diana, how about you? How we move forward? I have a one word answer, but I will elaborate. <laughs> uh, my one word is the resilience. We have yeah. to keep doing what we have done yes. and uh, to keep giving a voice to the people from our uh, communities. But I also, I want to uh, 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 raise a, uh, give a warning. I think uh, it has happened in my, in my, to my knowledge occasionally, I think we should, we should never forget that we are journalists. We should never forget. We should also ask ourselves, if I were back home, what story I would have worked on? From which perspective? What I'm trying to say, we should avoid the niche mentality the ethnic ghetto mentality, mm -hmm. which, uh, because I have seen, uh, you know, long reports 
about nothing just because that nothing happened in in uh, in the Romanian community, like uh, long reports about the soccer game, which deserve thirty seconds, not twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't forget to give substance to our stories, and we shouldn't forget to place things from perspectives. You know, the Russian doll is like this community from the small town in Canada, which is in a province, which is in a country, which is on, in, on a continent, in North, on North American continent, and so on, and so on. Mm -hmm. I worried that sometimes uh, we may lose the inter, not just the multi, we may lose the international, the global perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, that's all I had to say. Think, would, would I have worked on this story if I were back home? Is this what I want to tell the audiences from the entire world? Do I want to talk 20 minutes about nothing? Mm -hmm. Do I, do I make sense? Paula? You make absolutely sense. Absolutely. It makes, it makes more sense because you are invited us to think deeper and to take the profession, you know, the journalism as, you know, with ethics and with professionalism, which is something that I guess I had actually warned us before about the fact that, that in, in what he has witnessed, there is no that level of equality in what is being reported because there are certain principles of journalism that are broken. And I think that's something that is so crucial about community journalism and the type of work that we are trying to people in these spaces is that we have critical thinking, that we also engage our communities in the spaces of thinking and empowerment that comes through the power of information, not with misinformation, but giving people perspectives and respecting them enough to recognize that they are agents of change and decision makers. And therefore we provide information and they can make their own you know, analysis of those informations. And, and that is power. I, once again, I'm extremely, extremely honored to have each one of you, Diana, thank you so much for those closing words, which uh, represent uh, also an element that we need to leave this space with. It's not about romanticizing a space or romanticizing a community, but it is, go ahead, Diana, before we close. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, sh I think we shouldn't shy away from also being self-critical, not just critical. You know, like see our own issue, our communities and personal issues, not just, you know, complain or uh, notice what everybody else does wrong. Uh, absolutely. And I think that is the, this is where the power of, of, uh, of this self, uh, the, of the self uh, analysis and the self reflection comes with when we actually go and believe that our communities are worth and we respect them enough to engage them in process of self reflection that in, involves an inner crit critics of what we have been doing because our histories are full of of the isms, our histories are full of colonization, our histories are full of wrongdoing as well. And so how can we uh, make changes and move forward to a place where we respect everyone, right? And by that, everyone is our, the people in our community, but other communities as well. It has been an honor. I feel extremely, extremely um, happy and grateful for having the opportunity to chat this afternoon with you all for having the first panel of the Happening Multicultural Festival being this one uh, with, with the quality and the amazing uh, panelists that you all have been today. Thank you for giving so much this afternoon. Thank you for being part of the Happening Multicultural family. We want to uh, thank everybody that stay with us a little bit longer than, than planned, but it was totally, totally worth it this is a conversation that we're gonna treasure and that you can actually access in our YouTube channel because these are the type of conversations that we immigrants, creators, artists, newcomers, refugees are, are capable of holding and that 
with this type of conversations and actions is that we contribute to our communities. So thank you very much, everyone that joined us. Remember, we have more events uh, to come. Thank and you. Thank you to Paul. No, I'm a sag in, in my in my in my language, I say I'm a sagnano. We have to <laughs> we have to share some words to I'm a sagnano. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And we will see you soon in our next event that starts at 6 p.m. And it is the power of collective voice and music. So see you, everybody, in that event. So thank you so much for joining us. And as, as I mentioned, this event is in memorial of our friend and colleague, Aaron Berhami. Have all wonderful yeah. rest of the day. You too. Bye. Bye. May he rest in peace.